panel number five, which talks about the topic business transformation navigating with hybrid intelligence CEO session. I take this opportunity and would like to welcome once again Mr. Manoj Agarwal, Group Editor, Banking Frontiers. He is the moderator for this panel. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. I have a very sitting job, so I think I'm enjoying standing here. Uh, <clears throat> also, standing here gives me a good view of the audience and the panels, like a 360-degree view of the conference. So friends, uh, this is our final panel for the day. The topic is business Hello. transformation. Hello. And the topic is very valid Hello. and very important because for the NBFC sector in India, transformation is happening at a hectic pace. And the holistic part of that is business transformation. So there's technology transformation, there is people transformation, there is process transformation, there's compliance transformation, and all those transformations, but you put them all together, that's business transformation. And that's why this topic is deserving of a CEO panel. Uh, apart from the regular panelists, I've had the pleasure, or I have the pleasure today of having uh, Narendra sir, former Managing Director of Indian Overseas Bank. He's also a member of the Jury Committee for the NBFC Awards. So is Gigi Maman. Uh, so friends, what I'd like to open with is a simple question. Uh, there's a lot of transformation happening, and there's a lot of innovation happening. The question is, what is the cause and what is the effect? Who is the driver and who is the passenger? And there may not be one answer, there may be different. In different scenarios, it may be innovation driving transformation. And in some scenarios, it may be transformation uh, driving innovation. So in your experience, what do you see? In what kind of use cases do you see transformation driving innovation? Which means maybe it's top down driven. And in what cases do you see innovation driving transformation, which might be an example of bottom to up innovation? Your experiences, your observations. Uh, maybe, Bonani, we can start with you. Thank you so much, Manuj, and thanks for the invite. Pleasure to be here. So, I represent NAP Samruddhi, a subsidiary Naps. of NABAR, NBFC, mostly into wholesale lending, but extremely impact focused. So what we have seen is that, of course, innovation does drive transformation, no doubt about it. Okay. And I think that would be a very like, common answer that anybody would expect, that there's so much of innovation, it's totally disrupting the financial ecosystem, and it is inducing transformation in a way, everywhere, the way we do business, the way business is happening at the field level, the way it has totally transformed the entire scene there. But when we look at the other side also, it's equally true because we have seen in two, three uh, aspects or scenarios where it's been the other way around. One oh. is when you reposition yourselves for whatever reason. When we reposition, that kind of transformation induces innovation. You have to become very innovative, bring in a lot of changes, and then you ask for the innovation. That if if I'm totally a different organization today, I can't continue to do things the way I've been doing. I will need innovation in systems, processes, products, every which way. Secondly, if the regulator expects a change from you, we have seen the scale-based regulations happening. So that kind of change when suddenly you have to deal with ICAP, suddenly you know you are pushed into a lot of regulatory stringency. You have to look at innovation because if you continue with the same way you were doing business, it's very difficult to cope up. And the third we have felt was climate change, which was induced, mm. which was actually imposed because nobody expected the impact that we are feeling today. We can see heat waves affecting the business of microfinance institutions. We have seen heads of MFI saying that heat waves have affected our credit costs. So you have to then buck up because whether it's mitigation, we think that is the government's call, it's not because all of us are, you know, kind of, we have to own it up. So while mitigation happens and it takes time, climate change is anyway upon us. 
So we have to adapt. And to adapt, that is where we really need to induce the innovation. And we have done that actually right now. You would know that we are working in the climate ready wash space. And we are looking at startups, at tech companies, to come up with newer innovations to oh. cater to climate resilience in the water and sanitation sector. Because without that, the sector cannot sustain. And without water and sanitation, which are basic needs, again, the financial sector itself cannot sustain. So these have been our experiences. Thank you. That's interesting that uh, yeah, the innovation has to look at such a very basic thing, like water and sanitation. Because these are kind of things that we take for granted. But there again, we have to apply our intellectual and our mental capabilities. We is cannot continue with the generic solutions. Correct. That's what with floods, droughts, cyclones, sea level rising, salination. With all of that, we cannot, and heat waves, we cannot carry on with the same generic solutions we had. Right. We have to innovate. And there is a lot of innovation happening. We are asking for it and financing it, supporting it with blended finance. Super, so that's super. how it is. Who would like to go next? Yeah. So whether uh, innovation or business transformation, we'll have to be keeping in view the customers. The customers value proposition, customers value drivers, customers delight. So keeping in view the customer in mind and their aspiration, their current uh, changing uh, dynamics in terms of their uh, uh, ease of doing business or in terms of uh, their, you know, how quickly you deliver or how you will be able to innovate the products which can take care of the requirements. So in terms of the customer in mind, there will be a lot of innovation. It can be a technological innovation. It can be a product innovation. It can be a process innovation. And mm. it can be even in terms of the delivery uh, innovation, there can be so many uh, MIS and other things can be implemented. And leave, keeping in view, the business gets transformed. But for all that, there must be ownership. Without the ownership of the, those innovation or without the ownership of the, and the commitment to make it successful, just for the sake of any business transformation, will not sustain long. So it has to be in line with the short-term, medium and long-term vision and the mission and the goal of the organization. And in terms of their core, as well as core value, core purpose and core enhancement, see the, all the visionary companies mm -hmm. earlier, no, the built to last book, of padha to udhar manu padega. Yes. Like, you know, say for example, uh, Man never land, thought that they will land on the moon, mm -hmm. but they could land on the moon. That's where there has been a, uh, that bog, big, hairy, audacious goal. So once the goal looks very da daring and it is the human uh, normal prudence says that it is not e reachable, but with the will and the commitment and the core commitment, it could be reached. That's where yes. today you find so many miracles happening due to the innovativeness of the, their country or the people around. And uh, sometimes the country may be very small, mm -hmm. but in terms of technology and in terms of the superiority yes. of this, they may be controlling the whole world. And without them, nobody can achieve uh, their desired objectives. So any part of the organization or any part of the there, there will be something, somebody that is where we have a valid suggestions being taken in the organization. And these suggestions are given to the suggestion committee and whenever that suggestion get into an innovativeness and the positive financial and the customer impact. That's where uh, even in your uh, the award and all, we are more on the impact aspect. Impact. As Madam said that mm -hmm. today, sustainability, and uh, regarding uh, know, the eco uh, system for climate risk management, climate mitigation, and uh, climate adoption, uh, that has become part and parcel. So any organization which doesn't do something innovatively and uh, make the organization transformation to see that we don't add to the carbon emission, 
but we take care of that in terms of that is very important because our sustainability in on a long term is based on that so as you rightly said water conservation or uh, even in terms of the you no know, the quality of the cleaning clean, drinking water waste management then land degradation which has to be so in terms of that every organization today has to be in line with the societal expectation and if they do something in that those innovations are also valued much much higher than the financial innovation and other things which they do because ba customers will now futuristically will deal with such organizations who are very sensitive to the this aspect mm, of that yes. and they will get even in equity raising or fund raising much better proposition thank you thank you narendra sir i liked one concept you introduced that while innovation and transformation we talk of two different things if you put them together you get a miracle like putting a human being on the moon or some big hairy audacious goals so that's very interesting transformation plus innovation equals miracle and literally if you go back to what uh, bonani ma'am said we need miracle there are so many areas we don't need just innovation just transformation we need a miracle uh, which is the need of the hour thank you so much for that insight ji ji would you like to comment on yeah. this thank you manoj and uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me for this panel uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of uh, banging frontiers events uh i am representing microfinance institutions basically sadhan is a association of microfinance institutions as also a self regulatory organization designated by reserve bank of india in microfinance sector innovations leading to transformation and transformation leading to innovation both are happening um, in in some way or other but more of transformation leading to innovation is what we have been seeing i'll give you a couple of uh, examples in uh, 2010 when uh, there was a huge crisis in the sector when uh, andhra pradesh there was an issue which lead, led to a major crisis you know, commonly known as andhra crisis uh, the sector was in a, in deep doldrums there is a time then uh, they thought about how to understand how to know about the liabilities of the person because the major issue was on because of the higher credit indebtedness on the people leading to problems that's how when the the credit bureau mechanism started mm -hmm. once the credit bureau mechanism started or it was introduced that led to a larger business growth in the sector mm -hmm. that is number one number two in uh, 2016 when uh, Uh, when demonetization has taken place that was another setback which the sector had mm. because basically the microfinance institutions microfinance sector itself was leading i mean dealing in cash only it was a entirely 100% cash in cash out uh, business mm -hmm. that is a time when uh, the sector thought about how to avoid dealing in cash and then uh, the digital mode of transfer of money through the banking accounts have was, was introduced so since 2016 you find that almost all 100% of the microfinance loans are dispersed by the digital mode through the bank accounts only mm -hmm. and of course that further helped in enhancing the business again in uh, covid came that is a time when uh, uh, the transaction itself or the meeting itself became a difficult uh, proposition right that that is a time when uh, both collection as well as disbursement as well as collection was uh, made in the uh, digital mode so what i was trying to say is that of course whenever there was a crisis that crisis was uh, taken as an uh, as a as a opportunity for uh, innovations or bringing newer process and that definitely help the bus business in microfinance to grow hmm. so more of transformation leading to innovation is what we have seen but i have also other examples for example i'll tell you uh, after the covid uh, imp covid impact when the group mechanism itself got diluted 
people started thinking about how to keep the group mechanism intact. So, uh, without uh, having to having to come together, then some of the MFIs started even digital means of meeting the people through the WhatsApp group and all. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that that kind of process also is there, but then more of uh, uh, the digital, uh, sorry, the transformation leading to the innovation is what we have seen in the sector. Okay, interesting. So Gigi, one of the things I could take from what you said is that when an individual does something different, it's innovation or a small team, but when a, a complete organization or a set of organizations, like the whole sector does something, we call it transformation. Uh, maybe and it that, is that driven also, by yeah. a black swan or a white swan or whatever. <laughs> that way also you can tell it's it's a entire sector is adopting a new mechanism. Yes, it means it's a transformation of the process itself. Correct. Like that example of credit rating. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, which were induced by the Andhra crisis. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Thank Interesting. Ganesh, what is your take on uh, transformation and innovation and their correlation? I guess the business luminaries have already spoken about much of from a business standpoint. Huh. I'd probably summarize it in maybe few lines, you know, in the okay. interest of time. I'd look at it uh, at the top of the layer, at the top of the pyramid, I would say customers and crisis are the mm. two important criteria that lead to innovation and business transformation. Because if you've seen the last five years, it's both customers and crisis has led to a lot of innovation and transformation across various businesses across sectors. Right. Um, and under that pyramid is where technology layer comes in because you can write as much of innovation and in fact, Sir mentioned about how as you know, people have landed on the moon. Now, obviously, technology is the backbone on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the top of which uh, these innovations and transformation happen. So I guess um, the, the value chain across the pyramid has to function in a seamless, synchronous fashion hmm. uh, in order for the uh, benefit to finally accrue back to the customer or to, for us to be, or for the business to be able to manage the crisis in a very efficient way. So at the end of the day, if we don't get customer experience, that's not going to help. If we don't manage the crisis well, like for example, COVID, right? Mm -hmm. uh, moratorium became a uh, became a crisis for for the for uh, you know all all lenders, right? And the the regulator came back with a with a with a guideline on the same, and that had to get uh, managed at a micro level, right? From corporate lenders to retail to MFI lenders, all of them had to uh, had to undergo this and. That became a business transformation, right? Because yeah. the technology had to get enabled in order to manage this, especially someone running, uh, you know, 50,000 crores, 100,000 crores of AUM. You have even, you know, 10% of them running running this moratorium. You're running a huge book uh, of, you know, NPA straddled under your under your belt. So it's a so both customers and crisis lead to innovation and transformation backed by technology to fulfill the entire value chain. So it's a loop the way you're describing it. Okay, that's interesting. You know, one interesting observation I have uh, for all these years that, for example, in 90s, 70s, 80s, banks started doing core banking and the treasury trans uh, automation and all that. All this technology transformation, there was a lot of resistance. These days I hear people saying that my the youngsters, they're using AI. Whether you want it or not, they're going to use AI to write an email, to solve a problem, to analyze a problem, do whatever it is. Even if sometimes that AI gives weird outcomes or hallucinations or unrealistic output. So I see a 180 degree transformation from a generation which resisted use of technology to a generation that can't do without technology, even if the technology has some negative impacts, correct? I'm sure individually you would have seen that. Today, you know, you take a 10, 15 year old kid, ask them to do something without their phone or without the computer, literally they are helpless, right? So is there that technology dependence which has come up not te te technology addiction, if I may use the word, 
okay, dependence. But, but technology is the first choice rather than a plan B or a plan C. So going forward, how do you see this kind of technology first approach uh, at the individual level? Okay, for a big problem, we'll have a meeting. There'll be a boardroom meeting or a team meeting or something and deliberations. So that's where the human intelligence is being used. But for many small problems, we're just, just completely leaving it to an Excel or an AI or a Google search. If Google search says this is a solution to the problem, you literally do that first and then worry about whether it is right or wrong for many small things. So now being employees and talent being a key resource for any organization, if there's that rush, blind rush towards adoption of some of these modern tools, what do you see as the impact, as the risk, as some kind of countermeasure that organizations need to take so that there is sanity in the overall outcome? Especially when you have very highly tech savvy employee workforce, which could be happening in some of the very tech savvy NBFCs. Yeah, please, please, use the mic. Yeah. Uh, I would use an example here that we were asked, uh, we had asked our uh, team, the, uh, the data analytics team, to come up with a peer comparison uh, module, which was on Python, and they had developed and they were actually uh, presenting it uh, very, with a lot of confidence. It was a good effort. But when they were asked that why this happened from this to this, they, the first answer was, I don't know. So the chief asked, then who knows? So they said, Python knows. So this is the danger <laughs> that can happen. There is an over-dependence, and they are sure Python is right. But it's always about Gigo, we always knew. One more thing that happens is that if there is no cleansing, then it is always about that only, what goes in. And I think the third thing that we see is that you know, uh, on, an in, on an individual level, I can take risks with my life, right? I can use anything. Uh, in fact, doctors always tell us, Ki don't go to Google for your diagnosis or prognosis. Yes. But we still do that. But for that, I, my ownership is to myself. I'm answerable only to myself. But in an organization, it's not so. We are all yeah. responsible or answerable to the organization. And in that, uh, there has to be a kind of... Uh, uh, answerability there and there has to be that control so that there is a hybrid intelligence that uh, oh. takes over AI is a great tool we cannot do without that I again repeat we cannot do without AI we cannot do without technology but there has to be an overlay of the human intelligence especially where uh, things are very different where where there is a black swan event for example ai will not have the answers because it's never even known about that the data is, does not exist exist as such but yes there has to be a uh, kind of uh, risk mitigation like you said the, it, the risk from uh, the, whatever is the risk has to be managed and yes. that's why there has to be a balance between the two so hybrid is the answer. Sorry, sir. So hybrid brings in the balance. Yeah, Abhi that makes a lot of sense. Agarwal ji, ye apne suno agar Reliance Industries, uh -huh. in the one year period, they removed 40,000 people. Instead uh -huh. of recruiting more people, 40,000 logon ko pe, AGM mein apne dega hoga, paper mein aaye. I heard about it. So yeah, that means, some of your efficiencies or specialization, what you think, and that had given you a supremacy in an organization for a quite a long time, that will become redundant. Because mm. somebody else, through the human technology only, human mind only, has been given all the directions in the uh, your, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence. Mm. So it takes quite a lot of work from the organization or wherever required, even in HR, whichever minor uh, related or what you call mechanical work, all that in HR also will be done. But HR intervention in terms of creating uh, and building a sustainable human capital, there the HR people will have the lot of role, Good. which has to be by their own uh, individual creativity and 
certain recognition, rewards, competence mapping, or uh, in mentoring, all that, technology will uh, give you a supporting hand, but you have to get involved. Same way in the finance sector, finance management, all that. Now, how do you manage the funds in such a way that in efficiently and get a better return on capital and better return to the investors or shareholders? Those things will have to be along with the technology you have to go. So in any organization, these two mom combination, and as you rightly said, today nobody has the time, suppose if somebody wants to do one service at the NBFC or even anywhere, nobody has the time and energy that, no, it will take this own time, that time, this time, nothing. Because mm. whatever felt need has to be fulfilled today only. So in that respect, whether it is a automobile supplier, whether it is a agricultural credit, in everywhere, the banks have already used technology. During COVID, you know, State Bank of India could release all the uh, yes. ad hoc credit all through the, you know, and they, nobody was to come to that and all, documentation, everything. And today that has become most of the public sector, Bailei Bola, the only private sector, no, public sector also has adapting. Yes. But as uh, along with that, as he said, the cyber security, then data privacy, data in uh, what you call that the protection, all that and customers' uh, secrecy protection, the data should not be breached. both security. So you cannot be blindly depend on technology. There also you have to have a check and balance, because sometimes if you in an artificial intent, whatever you have fed or the type of question you will ask to the artificial intelligence, that also has to be intelligent. Yes, Unless correct, you are intelligent, correct. you ask question, what the outcome will come, all will be wrong. Because that is where you are, uh, even Google may have, if you want a particular information, the way in which you will ask, that will throw. Otherwise, lot of other things are which are all not relevant to you. Correct, so, correct. This is the intelligence, human intelligence cannot be placed by any technology. So even in the artificial intent, the program has been developed by so many people who are developing the RT intelligent with a type of certain because these are all developed internationally, not domestically here. So the international ko hum adapt karke hamara intelligence se properly usse benefit lena, product outcome lena, that again we have to develop. And that's where the training and other, you know, your hmm. development is needed. So with that, aapne correctly bataya, the young generation, even in terms of knowledge creation, even in terms of skilling, in terms of uh, their requirement feeling, or in every area, they know how to utilize the latest technology. Latest technology. And uh, at the same time, sometimes they become so much in that, they forget that there are other uh, areas also to get knowledge. So it has to be a combination of all that, so that, but those who are first, who have not innovated and changed in the changing time, then uh, it may so happen, we'll be only a reference. Whenever they want us, <laughs> they will come, but you will not be in the participation. You have to be participating. You cannot be a merely observer. Right. So right. in the changing period, we should also be able to vib vibrantly participate. That's where we have to get adapted. Sounds good, sir. Ganesh, I want to come to you with the thought that uh, Bhumani said about Python knows. Now, as a tech organization where there's tons and tons of Python and all kinds of technologies, uh, does the organization face, does the organization see it as a challenge or as an opportunity that Python or something knows? And they're confident about what it knows. Yeah, so from a tech standpoint, obviously we uh, deploy our tech architecture on a platform that's, that's not just scalable, but where we know that the tech resources that we will utilize, not mm. just for uh, deploying the current application, but uh, at, a, at a scale that, say, for the next five, seven, ten years, is something that we carefully choose. So we have to be very sure okay. of, uh, of, the, of the tech platform that we build our tech, uh, you know, tech product on, which uh, necessarily needs to be both scalable and then the resources availability over the next few years. Because today, that is a problem. Uh, skills is a major issue. 
to in fact address the point made by both uh, both of them um, tech is an enabler but what ha what's happening today is that many of the large financial services companies when i mean when I, not banks essentially but say the fintechs and the nbf and many of the upcoming large nbfcs were scaling up big time uh, they depend so much on technology and their, their dependency on technology is so immense mm -hmm. that um, without naming the company, I can say there's a 20,000 crore company that's uh, designed to function in such a way that they don't want to have more than 400 people in their ops team. Wow. Right? So now that's a, that's a critical mass. They don't want to exceed that number because they believe everything else will, will, will suffer, including their ROI return to shareholders and so on and so forth if they if they exceed that so which necessarily means that all the you know the mundane work or the general work that used to happen say 20 years or even 10 years or 5 years before hmm. is today being uh, done through technology right technology. today if you went to a bank right um, and uh, you know you, t you have a housing loan and you want a statement of uh, account once you've done a part prepayment uh, it will probably still take you maybe a couple of days to get that statement of account, and you necessarily have to go to the ba to the bank branch. Mm -hmm. uh, these days, uh, you make a part prepayment, you get your statement of account, a revised statement of account with your uh, repayment schedule in the next uh, three hours. Right. So that's where the technology and and mind you, you needed an army of people if you are a large housing finance institution to manage that particular service layer. Right for statement of account and other customer right. services. Now all that is on a self-service portal, self -service. And, and you don't need those people. So your regular, mundane, operative work is being replaced by technology, which is, by the way, a boon and a bane because a boon for institutions who are focused on you know both return to shareholders and blah blah blah. On the other side, it creates a huge uh, area of disappointment for youngsters. Who are, who are, say, wanting to have a career in financial services, say, yeah. in operations, but they're not trained on, say, more domain-oriented work and more general management work, which may not sustain for the long term. So there is a, there is a, uh, there is a bane and a boon on, on both sides. So therefore, the, skill, the skillful need of the younger lot of people uh, who are trained in technology but not trained on the domain may not be, may be a, uh, it's a oh. chicken and egg story. So. That's okay, right. so that's where the conundrum lies. Uh, Gigi, if I may come to you, uh, if you can comment on the microfinance sector, how do they, they're yes, going on the digital bandwagon, but it's a sector that's very operationally intensive. And as we have seen so far from the discussion, that operations is where technology is eliminating a lot of jobs. Uh, how does the microfinance sector see its evolution in terms of the impact of technology. Uh, what has been an enabler so far? Will that become a transformer? Are they looking at more of AI? Are they looking at more of blockchain? Any, what is the sense you are getting from the microfinance sector? What is it that they're optimistic about? Yeah. <coughs> microfinance sector, as you know, it's a highly human intensive sector. Uh, in fact, uh, the sector employs more than 2.5 lakh of uh, people in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the operations is, it used to be entirely physically done. Uh, people used to go to the villages, have a meeting of the members, uh, of the prospective members, explain about the product, then they are given training, then they are, uh, what do you call it, they are, I mean, the, the applicants are, applicants are onboarded. So these are all done physically. So there is a lot of scope as far as uh, technological intervention is concerned, so that the cost of operations can be brought down. But then of course, I do take that point that more technology means there will be less employment opportunity. But then, there, if, if the sector has to really become more of, uh, more of operationally efficient, more technology needs to be, uh, has to be imparted. 
there are a lot of areas where technology has come into field. For example, earlier, entire application used to be taken in a physical form, but now everything, most of the most of the microfinance institutions does the law, I mean, uh, borrower onboarding through the digital mode mm. by using a tab or a, uh, or even a mobile. Okay. Secondly, uh, as I said, in the, after the AP crisis, that credit bureau came. So credit bureau check is a very, very handy instrument as far as uh, uh, appraisal is concerned. <coughs> then and there, by, by a click of button, they are able to know whether the borrower is having any kind of defaults, any kind of what is his credit history. Immediately you can get the, uh, at least whatever information collected on a credit bureau, that information immediately get, uh, uh, get uh, popped up because of the technology. Technology. Yeah. Thirdly, <coughs> the, 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 the documentation part, that used to be a major work, in, uh, but in many of the MFI still continues to be physical, but uh, many have adopted the technological part, like uh, companies like Legality and all have come and uh, helped uh, in the uh, digitized uh, I mean, uh, doc documentation, which also helps in uh, identification, the proper identification of the, the borrower. EKYC, oh. EKYC is another area which, which has really come in very handy as far as uh, the loan, ident loan, uh, loan identification is concerned. So many times uh, the problem which uh, the MFI faces is the fraudulent uh, uh, applicants. Uh. Somebody who has some four or five other cards. There are people with four, five, six other cards. They go to different companies and uh, take more. But if you have at least, uh, if you can do that EKYC mode of verification, it helps in a lot of elimination of these fraudulent uh, borrowers. Right. So that has come in, uh, quite handy as far as. And can, as I, a, can I ask you to kind of give a perspective how much has, how much cost reduction has happened? And to what extent does that get passed on to the borrower? Is uh, the borrower better off in terms of getting a lower cost of loan? <laughs> See, um, I am not very sure very much cost reduction has happened in this uh, process because still a human intervention is still there. E e even if uh, only thing is that his efficiency has increased, maybe the one who was handling 200 or 300 cases, now is hmm. in a position to handle maybe 300 cases or 400 cases. That way efficiency has improved or some kind of... Otherwise, the process still continues to be the same. And each and every check, like each KYC check, there will be some cost involved. Like uh, documentation, there will be some cost involved. So cost reduction, I am not very sure it has really happened. But efficiency has improved, definitely. And, okay. uh, and there is still possibility of more uh, intervention possible, especially using AI or blockchain technology. You can, uh, if you can uh, get a much more better analysis of a uh, prospective borrower, is uh, taking into account of the other transactions he or she has. If you can make an assessment about uh, how the borrower would behave, the his behavioral her behavioral pattern, if it can be, uh, mm -hmm. if it can be, that could be one areas where uh, okay. I think the future can, future of uh, MFI is there. Let yeah. me tell you, there is a need to change the whole process also. There is more innovation is needed because. Uh, the, that uh, generation has changed, as we uh -huh. rightly said. The older generation who started uh, MFI in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, they were prepared to go to a village, stay in the village, spend time and all. But mm. the present gen <coughs> generation doesn't have time for that. They would be, they are more aspirational and they want uh, time for themselves. They want time for their own uh, personal things, they want their own individual entertainment, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So the whole process needs to be changed. Probably a more of technological intervention by bringing the newer uh, technological advancement that can. Uh, Do you see a lot of collaboration between MFIs and fintechs? There are fintechs uh, collaboration. The one legality is one such uh, collaboration. Collaboration. Uh, see, there are uh, that many of the MFIs are not in a position to go for the EKVC because they are not uh, authorized to do that because I unless see. you have a, uh, what do you, AU, uh, so, so they go through the third party means. Similarly, documentation is done through the third party means. So th there is a possibility of uh, FinTech collaboration, at least in certain areas. Well, okay, there are still limitations. Yeah, yeah. 
Narendra sir. Micro finance institution on their own, they cannot spend so much on technology. Their capital uh, level, no, is not so high as compared to banks or NBFC. Right. So they have to be cost effective and uh, their, uh, that is where they are, uh, as he rightly said, uh, because far away, far away, such a distance, uh, they are not so educated also to use the latest technology. Mm. But the tools can be like buying, oh, you know, oh, that uh, uh, for the people at the faraway BCCs are using. That type of instruments and all are already there, which uh, that necessitates them to get, and so many people have now. But their sector per se is a very tribal or maybe so many remotest village and all. Because the, otherwise there are RRBs, there are regional... Uh, level uh, land, uh, what you call, BCCG. the local development banks, then other uh, NBFCs and the banks, all that, they have to have a specific category for themselves. Ah, and right. the margin may be at least 10 to 11 percent or more than that. Uh, 12 percent margin. So, uh, that should also cover the OPEX. Oh, the margin which you are talking oh, about, it's yes. a, it's a, it's a financial margin. Yes. It's not the, it's not the net margin. Actual margin. Uh, because you need to have opex of seven to eight percent. Right. Then you have a risk mar, uh, risk mar, uh, margin should be there. There should be a risk premium should be there. Then some, their actual margin, return on asset, has to be around three to four percent. Then only. It sector can really. Definitely, totally agree. Credit costs are very high because it's a section, it's a segment of the society where risks are higher, not just perceived yeah. risk. And when we look at other NBFCs who go for straight through processing where they have not even seen the borrower, they go by whatever the BRE are, is into their LOS, it's possible, but there also we are seeing a lot of cash burn. But this is something MFIs cannot afford because we are dealing with the segment with whom we cannot take a chance. They are mm -hmm. marginalized, they are very vulnerable. And there, uh, your question again, where we put the human layer, where it comes to assessing microfinance clients or even deciding on their loan, when to take it back, there is a kind of a unspoken group guarantee also that comes in. And that is where the credit officer needs to know who is the person and who are the group members. And that is where the human intelligence or emotional intelligence also comes in in terms of ethical judgment then you're actually biased. There's a lot of AI which, there can be a bias in AI as well. Oh, yeah. So that bias gets removed when you actually see what is the circumstance of your borrower. And you think, okay, they are into this, so we can at least delay a repayment EMI and somebody else can come into that. All those things, CGG, GRT, that sir was talking about, it's about that only. The kind of ethical judgment, the kind of sensitivity to the borrower, that AI as of today, so I there's a good amount tomorrow. of subjectivity even yes, now, yes, and which yes. AI cannot handle. Right, so time's up.